welcome our board members, dignitaries of Sanskar Dham, leads of Anantyu, faculty members and students to be a part of today's event. We at Anantyu are extremely grateful to our chief guest, the Honorable Minister of External Affairs, Dr. Shubramanyam Jay Shankar, for his august presence today. Although he needs no introduction, for the benefit of the audience, he is a member of the Rajya Sabha of India's Parliament from the state of Gujarat. He was the Foreign Secretary from 2015 to 18 and an ambassador to various countries like USA, China, Singapore and the Czech Republic. A recipient of the Padma Shri in 2019, he is also the author of the widely acclaimed best-selling book, The India Way, Strategies, Strategies for an Uncertain World, which was published in the year 2020. I request our provost, Dr. Anunay Chaube, to kindly felicitate our chief guest, Dr. Jay Shankar, with a small token of our gratitude. Sir, I would like to inform you that this felicitation stole has been handwoven on the heritage looms of our university by the local weavers and students of the Sustainable Fashion and Textile Design Department. It reflects, it reflects the university's philosophy of inclusion, self-reliance, and sustainability. I now request Professor Sharmila Sagara to kindly felicitate our guest, Ms. Nivedita Mehra, with a small token of our gratitude. I now request our Provost, Dr. Anunay Chaube, to kindly come on the dais and deliver the welcome address to our August gathering. <clears throat> Dr. Jashankar, Honorable Minister of External Affairs, Government of India, Dr. Pramathraj Sinha, founding Provost of Anand National University, Ms. Nivedita Mehra, Managing Director, United States India Foundation, Sri Amrut Bhai Patel, Dr. R. K. Shah, Chairman of Sanskar Dham Trust, uh, Sri Dalip Bhai Thakar, Sri Durgesh Agarwal, Professor Sharon Ravich uh, from Penn Graduate School of Education, visiting us as a Scope uh, Scholar, the amazing artisans from the Narmada District, on behalf of Anand National University, students, faculty, and staff, I welcome you all here today. It is a day of great honor and much excitement for all, all of us here, to have Dr. Jashankar in our midst. So you have clearly emerged as a role model for all Indians today, young and old, and indeed, if I were to add, a role model for any culture and community around the world that looks to develop confidence in, and belief in its own values and traditions, abilities and potential, and articulate it to the world in a logical, dignified, impactful, and inspirational manner. We are all looking forward very eagerly to your talk today, and our young students in particular are the most excited. Our students, along with our faculty display a connectedness with the fast-changing world and an awareness of the diverse problems that it's beset with. And through the years that they spent on cam campus and beyond, they work on solving these problems using design thinking, fusing traditional design practices with contemporary cutting-edge technologies. They work in the field and in the labs. They work collaboratively in teams that are diverse. They work with communities and a host of stakeholders. They work to design a new future. They work to design a new paradigm of sustainable, equitable, and an inclusive world. It is a huge challenge. They need guidance, insights, encouragement, and inspiration to make an impact on a local and a global stage. They need to develop belief in self and in the values of their traditions while engaging with the world as designers, architects, climate scientists, innovators, entrepreneurs, educationists, or practitioners in any field. Sir, given your long and vast experience as a diplomat, 
of working across a range of socio-political, uh, socio-cultural, geopolitical contexts across the world, representing our country and its values at all times, we believe today there can be no one more suited to guide and inspire our students and indeed everyone here with your presence and your talk. I'm sure this engagement will prove to be a milestone in the learning journey of our students. We welcome you with all our warmth and gratitude, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing those words. I now request Professor Sharmila Sagara, the convener of the Anushilp Collaborative, to share a few words about the Collaborative. Thank you, Nishika. Uh, respected Chief Guest, Dr. Jay Shankar, uh, founding member of Ananta National University, Pramit Sina, our provost, Dr. Adonai Chaudhary, our collaborating partner, Nivedita Mehra, Anushilp artisans, Anushilp team, and dear colleagues, friends, and ever motivating students. On behalf of Anushilp, I extend my heartfelt gratitude for your esteemed presence here today. Uh, as the Anushilp project commenced, I'm cutting it short uh, because we are short of time. As the Anushilp project commenced, we embarked on our first visit, immersing ourselves in the villages, observing the artisans' craft practices. Engaging with their families and glimpsing into their lives, it was during this time that we identified bamboo patchwork and crochet work as potential crafts. With the intention of inviting these artisans to a residency, residency program at Anantio, our aim was not to only understand them and learn from their expertise, but also to enhance their craft practices for the contemporary market through design and technological interventions and thus our journey began. Though this, through this project, Anushat strives to train 18 artisans as master craftsmen who will in turn share their knowledge, upgraded skills and wisdom with their community members and train them. Anushat envisions providing assistance, guidance and support to these artisans, enabling them to connect with larger audience. We hope that soon the world will witness their artistry. I express my heartfelt gratitude to our Chief Guest, Dr. Jay Shankar, for providing us with this opportunity. I also extend my thanks to our provost for placing their faith in us. Most importantly, I'm immensely grateful to the artisans of Narvada district for welcoming us into their inner circle with, with warmth and enthusiasm, their eagerness to learn, their sacrifices of being away from their families, and their enthusiasm for being part of this new environment served as an inspiration to all of us, propelling us towards the success of this project. I extend my gratitude to all of you for your unwavering support and encouragement. I kindly request each one of you to visit the Anushil exhibition in the gallery where the artisan's creations are on display. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Sagara. It is now time to listen from the chief guest. So I request uh, the Honorable Minister, Dr. Jay Shankar, to kindly address the gathering. Dr. Sina, Dr. Chobe, Professor Sagara, Mr. Vedita Mehra, Distinguished founders of this university, trustees, the academic faculty, uh, students, and the Anushya team. Uh, I'm really very, very pleased to be here. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here partly because I'm always pleased when I come back to Gujarat, uh, which has sent me to the parliament. Uh, I'm also very pleased today at uh, an opportunity to see the work of the Anushal team because uh, this is a effort uh, which is made centered around Kevadia and as a member of parliament from Gujarat, uh, I, uh, I have uh, focused on Narmada district and Kevadia for my developmental commitments 
uh, which is largely what I was doing yesterday. And also because this is an outcome of a partnership uh, with the uh, US ISPF, of which I was a member before I became a minister. So you can see that there is a lot of uh, interplay here of many, many factors. But most of all, I'm really pleased because uh, every time I come to a university, you know, I my first reaction when I go to university today is a great envy. But because I look, I remember the university, you know, universities where I studied, uh, I look at the enormous progress today, the facilities, the opportunities, uh, the, the awareness, the knowledge that uh, the younger generation has. Uh, but uh, that feeling of envy always gives way to a sense of expectation that all of you, you know, uh, uh, coming through uh, this educational process, uh, it is uh, you people on whom the hopes of this country rest. Uh, and uh, therefore, in that sense, I, I kind of begin with envy, but I leave with confidence. Uh, and I'm really very glad that I went through that range of experiences again today. Now, uh, I was asked to speak about my business, foreign policy. Uh, and uh, they gave me some options, and I think we ended up with Modi's India, a rising power as the subject. So let me put this to you in a way in which you will readily relate, okay, as a design concept. Think of Modi's India as a designer, and think of rising as a process of design, because what are we trying to do today in international relations. We are trying to shape the world. Uh, we are trying, in a sense, to, to redesign it, because there's already a design that we have inherited it over many years. Uh, it is partly a design process, partly it's an architectural exercise. Uh, so uh, think of what you, you dream about apply to what I'm trying to do and think global. I mean, that, in a sense, is what today international relations and what we are trying to do uh, in India is all about. Now, why did I pick Modi's India as a <coughs> Because I genuinely believe that Modi's India is different from its predecessors. It is different in its outlook. Uh, in many ways, you can see, uh, if you look today uh, at the politics of India, at the representation of India, at the, uh, at the thinking, the parlance, the metaphors, the policies, it is in many ways the result of really 75 years of a very deep democracy, uh, which has, whose inclusiveness has really brought forth uh, a leadership and a thought process. Uh, that is uh, really authentically Indian. The second is that Modi's India is actually a return to a political uh, dispensation that has a majority in parliament. And I cannot overstress to you the importance of that. Because some of us are perhaps, I'd say, experienced enough to remember a time when this was a given. And then we actually, after 1989, from 1989 to 2014, uh, we went through a period uh, really where the idea of a majority rule was not there. And it had enormous consequences on governance, on policy. So this, I say, as a, in a sense, as a non-partisan political science part, that a, a country like India, if it is to progress, if there have to be the right policies, the vision, the confidence to do all that, it is very important that the, uh, the government is formed with a decisive mandate from the people. And that is one of the characteristics of Modi Singh. And the third, of course, is the leadership, uh, the vision. Uh, I think I'm in a university which saw early expressions of that vision and the ambition. Uh, the ambition of 
making something very much more out of India than we had in the past. Uh, in a sense to realize a potential that uh, at times we ourselves perhaps uh, did not fully uh, understand uh, and appreciate. So when Modi's India becomes a rising power, what does it do? I mean, you would say, okay, we are today the most populous country, we are the fifth largest economy, we are growing, maybe in a few years we'll become the third largest economy. But is that all? I mean, is it automatic? I would suggest to you that that isn't the case. That the process of rising of any country, of any society, of any people, actually involves expressions of talent, uh, of technology, of, of articulation, of, of influencing, of having a voice, of having a spread that the capabilities, and most of all, of having a personality, which means having a culture and values and civilizations uh, that uh, underpin. So that to me today is actually the landscape that I see as foremost. Yeah. I see a country today uh, with, with a vision of where it is going with an ambition for where it is going. Building up capabilities, because without those capabilities, I will come to it later. You know, the process of rising cannot only be by diplomacy. In fact, I am the, the last block on that chain, that so many other things have to happen if diplomacy is really to deliver. And at the end of the day, a diplomacy of any country is as good as the capabilities of that country. So this, this is, to me, the, the landscape. And as I said, the challenge is, how do we redesign the world in which we live? Now, if you consider the world over the last decade, uh, it's actually become more difficult. It's become more uncertain. It's become more volatile. I would say, particularly in the last few years, it has even become more turbulent. And for, for uh, people in foreign policy, the minimum expectation of such a world is at least navigate it smoothly. You know, make sure there are no mishaps, uh, that you know, play safe, do the right decisions. But that is a very minimal way of thinking. That is not necessarily, you know, that's not what you do when your ambitions are big, when you have goals to achieve and you want to speed up the process of rise. So there's the next level. And the next level is really how do you manage the turbulence, the uncertainties. Uh, but the real, I would say, you know, when, when you're really uh, sort of uh, good at it, the, the possibility is that all of this, the uncertainties, the turbulence, how do you leverage them? So the world may be difficult, but that is not a reason for us, in a sense, to go into a shell or keep our head down. On the contrary, it is a time, if you can understand the world, if you can assess the possibilities, if you have the right relationships, uh, I would say between clarity, uh, strategy, uh, in a sense, if you have the tactical boldness, and if you have most of all the confidence. It is possible today to actually use this this uh, very complex landscape uh, today for uh, the betterment of India, the faster rise of India. And that is really what Modi's India is seeking to do. Now, um, I have referred to a landscape. So what is this landscape that we are talking about? Obviously, much of the world is influenced by the big powers. So you can say, in a way, there is a big stage out there. Uh, and today, I, I think in all honesty, I would say India has got on that big stage. And that stage, uh, the, the main characteristic of that stage is actually globalization. A globalization process which has uh, unfolded in the last uh, 20 to 30 years. 
And as a result of that globalization, actually, there's a rebalancing in the world. The countries which earlier dominated the global economy, which dominated global conversation, were not the same countries today, or even if they are, they would not dominate it to the same extent. And nothing illustrates that more uh, than the fact that what used to be an annual meeting of G7, which used to, in a sense, set the terms for where the world is going every year, it was like a board of management of the world, huh? that has now become a meeting of the G20, and we have, of course, this year, the privilege of being its president. So the, the globalization, rebalancing, the broadening out, you might say, is one way by which uh, we look at the world. But the world has compelled us to look at some of the challenges inherent in it. And probably nothing was uh, a more rude awakening uh, than the COVID pandemic. Because the COVID pandemic actually brought home to all of us the dangers of economic concentration. That if in the world a very large part of products and you know, resources and components were made in particular geographies. And if there were disruptions, or if they were to be in some way misused, leveraged, then I think the rest of the world actually has a problem. And we've had a problem, all of us. You know, uh, as I, I remember 2020, 21, uh, when COVID hit us, I mean, the fact was that very basic manufacturing was not there in this country. I mean, today I heard about how uh, here in this university you made masks. Now, just think about it. We were, we, at that time, we were the sixth largest economy in the world. We were dependent on masks from outside. We were dependent on ventilators, on CPEs, on APIs for the pharmaceutical industry. So, and, and we were not unique. That the, what actually the COVID brought home to a whole lot of countries was that don't, don't allow your economic security, your social stability, in a way, to be determined by excessive exposure outside. Now, just when we thought we had come through a very big challenge, the COVID challenge, we of course hit another challenge, the Ukraine conflict. And the Ukraine conflict also was very interesting because you know, it's not like the world has not had conflicts before. But this time around, partly it was the nature of this conflict, but partly it shows you how deeply we have become interlinked. That immediately energy prices went up, food prices went up, fertilizer prices went up, general inflation went up. And, you know, we had to take, uh, make a set of choices actually to keep it under control. So what did it do? really for, for international politics, I would say, in fact, even for international economics. It taught all of us that go out there and as quickly as possible, build as many resilient, reliable, redundant supply chains as possible. So that the next time some big mishap hits you, you are not dependent on one source and one country. There was a, at the same time, a different problem in the same time frame, which was also big. And this is a problem, actually, of data. Now, today, I think each one of us, probably the first thing we do when we get up is first pick up the phone and look at it. We are walking generators of data. Our phone knows more about us than we do. And the consequence of that is if the data and, you know, as you move into a world of artificial intelligence, how do you actually deal with data privacy? How do you deal with data security? How do you deal with national security, which comes from, you know, an inability to control uh, who has your data, who's processing it, who's harvesting it? So resilient, reliable supply chains becomes the first challenge. Trust and transparency in the digital domain becomes the second challenge. And then this world we are moving to. Today we are talking about mobility. We are talking about renewables. 
even as I said, you know, communications, smartphones. Here now, critical and emerging technologies and the resources that are involved uh, in it have suddenly become very important. I briefly studied chemistry. For me, lithium was just one element up there and not a particularly interesting element. Today, the world kills for lithium. And that, those are today the supply chains, the data issues, the critical technologies, the critical resources. These have actually become the big issues. And that then leads us to a very different direction. And the direction is of trusted collaboration. So when I look at the world, all countries are not equal to me anymore. I ask myself, it's, it's a bit like society or business, you know, human relationships. We don't trust everybody the same. You know, we have good experiences with some, we don't have with others. Some are like us, some are not. So how do you actually build today a world of trusted collaboration? And that is today a key issue in foreign policy. And it is an issue for which, as I said, we require enormous domestic capacities. We require deep strengths. You know, we require the kind of skills and talent and creativity and education uh, and capacities which we had not, for whatever reason, built up after 1992. But today we have to make up for that lost time. So for me, the change that you know we as the Modi government are trying to bring about within India, you know, for me, make in India, uh, you know, production linked incentive, Atma Nirbhar Bharat, Smart India, Gati Shakti. These are not a separate world from my life in foreign policy. They actually directly feed into what my capacities are, what are the cards that I have when I go out. You know, what are the deals that I make, how fast therefore can I rise, how much can I redesign and architecture a landscape uh, to my take. Now, when I you know, put out the challenges, obviously one part of that is how do we, uh, as a big country, as a country with a great future, how do we make our decisions based on our interests, on an independence of thought and action? How do we ensure that we do not get pressurized by other countries? And this is a big challenge, because it is a bigger challenge in a globalized world. Because all these linkages which globalization, all of them in one way or the other, people may not say it so directly, they all become forms of pressure. So if you import oil from somewhere, that's a point of pressure. If you import food from somewhere, that is so. If you are getting you know, medicines from somewhere. So how do you actually develop that, both the capacity and equally the mentality to be independent? And we have been through our share of challenges. We have been, you know, you saw that when it came to buying oil from Russia. You saw that when it came to membership of this group called Quad in the Indo-Pacific, uh, where, uh, you know, again, uh, attempts were made uh, to actually play mind games with us, saying that, no, 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 by doing this somewhere, you are compromising your own independence, when, in fact, we were strengthened. It could happen, you know, on issues like connectivity, where there may be strategic agendas of connectivity and people push you to do it saying, everybody else is joining, so how can you stay out? So pressures come in different forms. Often pressures come, as I said, through a herd mentality, through a kind of a psychological uh, you know, effort uh, at creating collective thinking. But in all of this, when I talk about uh, big powers, of course, we have a particular challenge from China. Uh, that, chi that challenge is a very complicated challenge, but in the last three years, I think it has been uh, particularly visible uh, uh, in the border areas. Uh, and there are, uh, there are uh, clearly responses that are required, and those responses have been undertaken uh, by the government. And a lot of it is to ensure that no attempt is made 
to unilaterally change the status quo uh, in the border areas and that you know we will ensure that peace and tranquility uh, there is the basis of our relationship that if peace and tranquility is disturbed it cannot be that the relationship remains unaffected now i have spoken about the big stage the big pass but there is the immediate stage the immediate stage are our neighbors and i must say that in the last 9 years this is one area where prime minister modi personally has brought about a revolution and it started on his first day as prime minister when he invited leaders of all our neighboring countries to participate uh, in his shafat dinner and since then we have been you know dealing with the neighborhood in a very different way think of it like your own neighborhood where you live you know if you are the biggest in your neighborhood it's in our interest that the other neighbors are are share in our prosperity share in our happiness are linked to us that they do not pull necessarily in a different direction and that will only happen if we take a very generous a very i would say non reciprocal way of engaging them and that thinking you know which which the prime minister has personally driven in the last 8 to 9 years it has actually completely changed uh, how how said south asia is linked to each other many of our neighbors like <laughs> bangladesh or nepal bhutan was always close to us uh, they are today linked with us through roads through rail through waterways we have electricity grid connections uh, there are fuel supplies and what in many ways this has done is that they benefit from the scale and the economy of it that if today india is able to refine fuel and give you the finished product at a lower price when you are linked to india that benefit also comes to a neighbor so the the perception today the linkages and the perception today of india in the neighborhood has changed and nothing illustrated that more dramatically than what happened to sri lanka uh, last year when they went through a very deep economic crisis uh, and we have actually stepped forward you know in a way in which we ourselves have never done before but what we have done for sri lanka is bigger than what the imf has done for sri lanka so and if any of you have visited sri lanka recently i think you will note the the popular perception that has accrued uh, from uh, this action <coughs> now when we think of a neighborhood we largely say you know neighborhood is sri lanka nepal maybe pakistan of course myanmar that's like like the limit uh, of what we think but that wasn't always the case i mean if you look before 1947 you know if you are if you had asked my grandfather what he thought of neighborhood my grandfather would have said singapore he would have said gulf eden you know i don't know whether he would have gone as far as egypt he would have certainly said east africa so what we are also trying to do today is actually a bigger india a more influential india a more ambitious india we are trying to expand what should be our neighborhood so we look at what are in a way extended neighborhoods i mean these could be the islands in the indian ocean uh the gulf you know again uh the gulf has seen a, a huge change uh which you know if you look at a relationship like uae uh, or uh, saudi arabia uh, i mean these relationships have really undergone an enormous transformation in the last it or go the other direction south east asia uh, and uh, i would say even central asia so in each each direction from what was a traditionally much more constricted view of our neighborhood we have actually undertaken something much more ambitious uh, and in each case of course the region is is different so you have to do each one of those differently but this has required in many ways a lot of effort clearly by 
the government collectively, I would say by the country collectively. Uh, because a lot of it is driven by business, it is driven by movement of professionals, uh, it is driven by economic benefits, but it is led finally by political thinking. And that political thinking, again, when it comes to the extended neighborhood, has been led uh, by the Prime Minister. Now, when I speak of the neighborhood, I referred earlier to the quad. I think, uh, uh, again, a big change of our era is what is called the Indo-Pacific. The Indo-Pacific really means that we don't look at the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean as two watertight compartments. Uh, it's a bit like, you know, two schools or two centers being merged uh, in a university with the, with the freedom really to operate in both. Because that is the reality. I mean, in real life, nobody, you know, it's not like a ship says, okay, I'm in Indian Ocean and I don't go across. But for us, when I look at it in terms of our interest, today more than half our trade goes east of India. I mean, we have become huge consumers of resources which come out of east of India. So, and strategically, you know, what happens there concerns us very much. At the same time, there are other big changes which are happening, changes which include the rise of China, which include, in a way, uh, you know, how the U.S. has become much more cautious about its own commitments. And all of this has uh, created, of course, a concept called the Indo-Pacific, but it has also created a grouping called the Quad, uh, a Quad which is U.S., Japan, Australia, and India. We just had a meeting last week in Hiroshima of the Quad. Prime Minister went there. Uh, he met his counterparts. And, you know, this is illustrative of the kind of new directions we are moving. Because if you look at the Quad, you know, the Quad is today discussing uh, maritime collaboration. It is looking at infrastructure connectivity. It is looking at 5G. It is looking at vaccines. By the way, it also offers fellowships. So, so there's a lot out there. I'm sure Nivedita will share some of that uh, with some of you who are interested. But what Quad does is it gives us more space. It gives us new partners. It gives us more comfort. And by the way, we have, we don't call it a quad, we have given it a somewhat musical name called I2U2, uh, but we have a group of countries to the west of India, India, Israel, US, and UAE. And here too, there is a group of countries who meet regularly, who discuss projects, and I mention this to you because this is also, in a way, a new way of working. This is actually part of this redesigning that we are talking about. And it's redesigning in the manner in which you work, the creation of platforms, the outcomes which are generated, and the relative weight of the of the theaters and the times. But while I've spoken about these changes, I also want you people to understand that under Prime Minister Modi, we are not thinking just of tomorrow. We are not even thinking of the next term. We are thinking really beyond. And in many ways, without exaggeration, we are today laying the foundation of what is a global footprint. A global footprint where an Indian presence, you can go to the farthest corner, to Caribbean, to South America, or you can go, by the way, where I just went with the Prime Minister of the Pacific Islands, places where Sometimes no Indian Prime Minister has gone. Sometimes no Indian Foreign Minister has gone. But today, these are places where we have engagements, we have a presence, we see business, we sometimes see education. Uh, so we see Indian services out there. So what is happening with us? You know, when you become the fifth largest economy and grow, we may not be conscious of it, but slowly our, you know, the ripple effect of what happens in India and by India. It goes through the entire world. So you can go to very, very remote countries. You know, I was uh, two weeks ago in the Dominican Republic. Trade between India and the Dominican Republic went up from $10 million to a billion dollars in the last two decades. 
And you know, many of us don't, are not even conscious of it. I mean, I traveled around Central America. I could get the same, uh, you know, medical the the sheet, the medicines, which I get in India, because today our pharmaceutical presence has really become so big. So, one part of it is we are developing a global footprint. The other part of it is we are actually shaping the big global issues, because there are you know we think of international politics as something between nations, and that is true. It is. But there are some issues which are bigger than nations, which are big, bigger than regions. Climate change. I mean, you people today are one of the few universities who actually have a dedicated program on climate action. Now, you know, this is actually absolutely an existential issue. Now, how can it be that we are the most populous country, we are the fifth biggest economy, and we do not have a big say in shaping climate action? You know, if that happened, we would be failing, not just in our diplomacy, in actually our basic duty to our citizens and to our planet. So, again, what is diplomacy itself? You know, the the effort, the the subject, the manner. So, uh, you would have seen a lot of the initiatives today, the big initiatives on climate action, actually are coming out of India, and. As someone who has accompanied the Prime Minister for many of these conferences, I must tell you a lot of it is coming out of his experiences in Gujarat. So, he, he was one of the earliest to embrace solar energy. Today we see that in a body called the International Solar Alliance. He, you know, after the Bhuj earthquake, he got very interested, he told me, in, in uh, disaster resilience. We have, we are today leading an initiative called the Coalition for Disaster and, uh, Resilient Infrastructure. There is a huge problem today, not just in food production, but in the kind of food we produce, the carbon footprint of agriculture. We are today actually the evangelists for millet production and have pushed through something called the International Year of Millet. So if you look today at the big ideas on the global stage, now I've given you climate action. It's also true uh, to some extent of counter-terrorism, of connectivity, of debt. And actually, our G20 presidency, our expectation, our hope certainly is a lot of these issues, because we have today a prime minister who is strongly convinced about this. Uh, that vision, in a way, has shaped the thinking of the system. We certainly hope that the big issues of our times, uh, our G20 presidency would be an occasion to take it forward. Now, I've spoken about the global footprint. I've spoken about global issues. Let me say a few words about something that will interest you all more, a global workplace. There are today approximately 3.4 crores, 34 million Indians and people of Indian origin who live and work abroad. And the number is growing by the day. There are roughly, by the way, about a million counterparts of yours who study abroad at any given time. Now, I say this because something very fundamental is happening in the world and that will actually shape what is our definition of the workplace. And that is when the knowledge economy meets the demographics of developed countries. So the people who will have the factories, the technologies, the consumption, will not have the people to actually meet them. So one of the interesting changes we have seen in the last few years, and again, this is something Mr. Modi was very quick to catch, which was a great interest in mobility. We just came, as I said, from Australia the day before yesterday, yesterday, day before yesterday I think yesterday. No, day before yesterday. Now, I mean, bear with me. Uh, uh, the, one of the agreements we signed was a mobility agreement. You know, something that allows professionals to move easily, that ensures that, you know, their rights are respected, uh, that, the, that the economic benefits which should be due to them are, are uh, given to them, which allow, by the way, students who go abroad also in some cases to work. 
So I mentioned that to you, but then all of this has a consequence. It has a consequence, suppose it is, it could be students, you know, when they get into problems like they did in Ukraine, it then becomes our obligation to do something. We just had a, there's a, well, a kind of civil war going on in Sudan. You know, we had five, about 5,000 Indians out there, and a lot of them were working in Sudan. In Ukraine, it was about 20,000 students. During, during COVID, as I said, that, that 3.4 crore Indians, uh, about 70 lakhs of them actually wanted to come back in some way because many were tourists, many were people working in cruise liners, in air crews, there were professionals, there were students whose hostels were closed and told you go back home. So that's a different kind of responsibility today arises, which is, you know, we have become one of those countries who have the ability today, and we are very proud of it who have the ability to use our national capabilities to look after our people. It could be in a crisis, it could be in the routine. We often, because we have so many blue collar workers outside, we have today rules and regulations, which all happened, by the way, in the last nine years. That, you know, if somebody dies and doesn't have the money to, you know, have the body sent back, or, or somebody gets into trouble, legal fees you don't have. So there are, how do you look after your people abroad? Because that is fundamental to being a rising power. You will not be regarded as a rising power if you leave your people to their own devices. So whether it is war, whether it is civil war, whether it is earthquake, uh, whether it is COVID, today that is a responsibility that we have to discharge. So as I said, we are today, you know, in a very unique position. Uh, the rise of India, though, has a very special significance for the world. Because in the last 200 years, countries have gone up and down, the colonial powers rose in the Second World War, after the Second World War, America rose, is still up there, the Soviet Union rose. Uh, but what is special about us is the only comparable rise is that of China. That a great civilization is in a way rising once again as a very major factor in international relations. So it is not just another country rising. The expectations of us are different. Our own expectations of ourselves should be different. We have to bring to the international stage our personality, our culture, our heritage. So when Prime Minister Modi, you know, uh, in a sense, uh, motivated the world to celebrate uh, the practice of yoga, it wasn't just a cultural or a fitness exercise he was advocating. You know, when he pushes Ayush during COVID wellness practices from India, it is today something bigger which is happening. How do we make the world understand our beliefs and practices? How do they, in a sense, get to know what is, what is India about, what are Indians about, what is, you know, what is the heritage, the culture, what is the DNA of this system? Because that is really when a country is seen as rising. So let me conclude with one last point, which is that you know, we marked 75 years of our independence. But what the Prime Minister did was, this time around, he asked us to think a little bit differently. He didn't ask us to think the next year, or the next decade, or the next term. He asked us to think the next 25 years. And I say this because that 25 years is going to be determined by all of us. We are actually today thinking of an era, of a generation or more. The responsibility of people like us today is really to lay the foundation, to prepare the groundwork. You know, that is, that is really the best thing that we can bequeath to all of you. But it is in your skills, in your talents, in the capabilities that we every day see created around us. Because I must say this, 
you know, when I travel, I, I must, you know, I can surely lay claim to being the most frequent flyer of India. I might even be the most frequent flyer of the world, but somebody in some airline crew could probably compete with me. But I want to tell you one thing, as somebody who travels a lot, this, you know, the curiosity about India that I see, the, the kind of questions that they have, you know, what have you done with, you know, how did you do something digital? How did you get this vaccination done? We hear, you know, some, you know, they will pick something, you know, it could be, it could be, and, and sometimes it would depend on who it is. I certainly would tell you uh, a lot of people in other governments, they look, for example, today at how this whole, you know, Aadhaar and Jam and, you know, the digital delivery has worked. It fascinates me. You know, I once told the Prime Minister, I came back from a trip. I said, I heard the word leakage from some other uh, head of government. So clearly others also have the same problem. So how do today, actually in many ways, our governance practices are a source of huge interest, but our societal change is a matter of great interest. I think the interest in the talent and skills of India, and I therefore hope in the universities of India, uh, will, will also uh, commensurately grow. So once again, I, I thank you all for having the patience to uh, listen to me. Uh, I want to say it's, it's really been uh, for me. I mean, this, this is really an enormously impressive university. Uh, I, I did a short tour, uh, but uh, as, as I said, you know, somewhere in the back of my mind, the feeling of envy is still there. So thank you very much. so much sir for getting us acquainted with the journey towards making of the landscape of a new India.